Hello everybody, today I'd like to talk about something new, something exciting. I've spent way more hours than I'd like to admit designing a theoretical dinosaur game. Now I lack the funding, time, and skill to create an actual video game, at least one of quality, but I'd like to prove to the dinosaur community that there's more to the world than empty walking simulators. This game is what I would consider to be the perfect dinosaur game. But I won't waste any more time, and I'll let you decide that for yourself. Introducing <laughs> Terrible Lizards is a death match that takes place in a carnivore's territory. The average match length should be about 20 to 25 minutes. Essentially, herbivores are trying to escape by traversing from one side of the map to the other. They have to cross rivers, destroy barriers, break down logs and branches to continue on their path, and eat and drink to maintain the instinct meter that's used to sprint and use special abilities. For matchmaking, there are 8 slots total for carnivore players and for herbivore players. For carnivores, Four slots are taken up by a large dinosaur, two by a medium, and one by a small. This means that you could have any variation of teams to work with as carnivore players, or fight as with herbivore players. You could have two large carnivores, four mediums, eight smalls, or any variation of all of these. Herbies are straightforward, and all fill two slots each, which means you will always have four herbivores of equivalent strength despite that strength varying in many ways. This means that you may outnumber the carnivores with the downside of them being stronger than you, face an equal number of similar strength carnivores, or be swarmed by a massive pack of tiny dinosaurs. Of course, because you could have any random variation, each game will be unique. Having one massive bone crushing dinosaur, one medium strength brawler, and four pint sized devils to fight against or team up with would make each game exciting and test your skills in each situation. Maps contain two outer forests on either side of an inner land area, and this can be forests as well, or rock formations or anything else that I can come up with. The map will always have at least one central river flowing down its entirety. This is important for some playables on both the carnivore and herbivore side. If herbies enter the outer forest, they will be highlighted for all carnivores and will have their instinct meter quickly drained. Carnivores have an instinct meter that is replenished by hunting AI that spawns in the outer forest. The inner forest contains the obstacles for herbivores to destroy. Carnivores can circumvent these by traveling through the outer forest unaffected. Essentially, the carnivores own the outer forest, so they can more easily traverse the land and fight in different areas depending on how far along the herbivores are in their quest to escape. Now, there are a few things that I need to talk about before I continue. One is bleed. Some abilities do various amounts of bleed, which drains instinct and can be healed by completing a medium length animation in a water source. Bone break is a little different. It will disable weaponry if it exists on the appendage affected and will slow movement if the appendage is needed for walking. So essentially, if you have a Therizinosaurus and its arm gets bone broken, you can no longer use that arm for slashing. Herbivores and carnivores will heal over time, but in a moment I'll show you why the carnivores are less affected. This is also why only large tier carnivores will have bone break to make it more balanced. New players will start out with 3 herbivores to choose from and 3 small tier carnivores. So new players aren't punished for being bad since they respawn quickly and can play with way more friends than small tiers. Carnivores and herbivores can roar. Carnies can use it to signal they've found herbies, and herbies because it's fun and I wouldn't take that away from them. Here are the win conditions. For herbivores, they must escape the territorial boundaries. It's really that simple. They do this by clearing certain obstacles around the map. They will be fun minigames though, not boring objectives, like Path of Titans collecting acorns. Carnivores, once downed, will be able to slowly retreat to the outer forest, where they will be able to function properly once more. This means that they will heal any injury they had. Then, depending on their size, they must hunt a certain number of AI to be able to return to the inner forest in a healthy state. They do this through scent trails. If they leave the outer forest before hunting all of the AI necessary, they will remain in the down state. But herbivores cannot respawn, and must use the resources they have to heal wounds and require teamwork to nurture wounded allies and protect them from further punishment. This may not seem fair, but remember, the herbivores just have to reach the exit, and any one of them, in any condition, 
can win the game for all of the herbivores. For the carnivores, all they have to do is attack and down the herbies. Herbivores are more resilient than the carnivores and have a constant health state with two down states within it. Essentially, what this means is the down state will make the herbivore useless, but it can crawl around slowly to reach teammates. One large carnivore, two medium carnivores, or four small carnivores can stand on top of them and stop them from moving entirely. Their health bar will drain constantly until they die or are revived. If left long enough on the initial down, the second down phase could be surpassed and result in a quicker death the next time they are downed, since the health bar never recovers and can only regress. Once all herbivores are downed or dead, the carnivores will win. This will prevent either side from ever entering the loading screen or respawning to increase immersion. It will appear as though carnivores aren't just dying and respawning, but they're retreating to the forest to regain their strength, which is because they are. That's exactly what they're doing, and I think that's cool. And it also gives the carnivores a sense of achievement when downing herbivores. It's obvious what the situation is at all times for all team members. Next we have traits. Both herbivores and carnivores can equip them. This might be an increase to speed, health, stamina, etc. Modifiers will be equal in strength despite differing buffs, and are unlockable to everyone in the game, for every dinosaur. But the carnivores also get a hazard. This could mean dense fog, flash flooding, or a meteor shower. And this would only occur in the inner forest for a very short period of time. The flash flood will essentially just increase the size of the river, and there are some playables that will greatly benefit from that. Now we move on to the roster, starting with the carnivores. The first one on the list is Sinotyrannus, my personal favorite. It is a large tier, which means it takes up four slots, so you can only have two of these on a team, and they are 30 feet long. You can use a portion of the instinct meter to create a loud roar, which blurs the vision of nearby herbivores for a short period. Your footsteps are rather quiet, which allows you to sneak in and pounce one dino for a draining instinct cost. If pounced for long enough, serious damage or death will come to the herbivore. However, you are vulnerable to attacks by other herbivores at this time, and the herbivore being attacked will be able to attempt an escape by successfully completing quick time events. Sinotyrannus is a glass cannon, good at separating herds and taking them out one by one. It has low health, high damage, medium speed, and medium agility. Next is Baryonyx, a very unique one. At 25 feet long, it is a mid-tier, meaning you can have four of these on your team. Baryonyx can swim through the plentiful rivers in the map. It moves rather slowly on land, but gets a significant speed boost when being in the water and after exiting. Baryonyx can use its instinct meter to charge a massive claw attack. This attack gives heavy bleed damage to the recipient. It's good at surprising prey, and has medium health, high damage, low speed, and medium agility. Next we have Deinonychus. It's a small tier, at just 10 feet long, meaning you could have 8 of these guys on a team. Deinonychus can pounce on herbivores, which drains his instinct meter at a constant rate. You have to be careful not to spend it all, because if you run out of instinct meter, you will not be able to run away. The pounce will do bleed damage and slow the target by a small percentage. This will stack if more Deinonychus pounce the target at the same time. Deinonychus can also send an AI packmate in a straight line. If it hits, the packmate will pounce. If it misses, it will be stunned for a short time, and then return if it hasn't been killed by an herbivore. If the packmate dies, you will have to locate it in the outer forest and retrieve it with a beckoning call. It's good at distracting and confusing herbivores. It has a low health, low damage, high speed, and high agility. Then we have Despletosaurus. It's another large tier. You can only have two of these. And it is once again 30 feet long. It has a crushing bite that breaks the bones of any appendage it can clamp onto. Using a significant percentage of its instinct meter, Despletosaurus can sprint a short distance after remaining crouched for some time. It's good at disabling opponent weaponry and slowing targets. It has high health, high damage, low speed, and low agility. Keep in mind that Despletosaurus is only faster than some herbivores when using its short sprint ability. It requires packmates to succeed, which means there's risk and reward for such a powerful creature. Lastly on the carnivore side, we have Shangiraptor. It's a small tier at just 5 feet long, and it's kinda just a meme dino, but don't count it out yet. Shangiraptor can glide from tree to tree, just like a Microraptor, and does no damage at all unless it is running on the ground, so you cannot peck things from the sky, cause that would be unfair. Shangiraptor grapples onto herbivores and immediately broadcasts its location to all other carnivores meaning it's highlighted so that everyone else on your team can see that herbivore at all times. You must then complete skill checks that get increasingly difficult 
until the Shangyu Raptor lets go. It is impossible to stay on forever. It then must escape to a nearby tree and do the process again. It's very slow on the ground though, so you have to be careful when you're jumping off of herbivores. If you don't have enough height and can't reach a tree, you will probably be stampeded. Shangyu Raptor has low health, low damage, medium speed overall, and high agility. Now we move on to the herbivores. First up, we have Miragaya. At 20 feet long, it's a reserved creature that is very helpful to the team, while also being a savage weapon when provoked. Miragaya can quickly drain its instinct meter to shake and buck uncontrollably, doing massive bleed damage upon contact with any dinosaur. You have to be careful when using this around teammates. Miragaya is good at scaring off attackers and making them leave to heal. Mirgai is also especially good at clearing vine obstacles. It has low health, high damage, medium speed, and medium agility. Then we have Bei Shanlong. At 20 feet long, once again, it uses some of its instinct meter to create a powerful leg kick. If it hits the attacker, it will blur their vision and hearing for a short time, and give Bei Shanlong a short speed boost in the process. It's good for stopping an attack and allowing weak individuals to get away or damage the enemy as Bei Shanlong is quick enough that it typically will not need this for itself. Bei Shanlong is especially good at kicking apart log obstacles. It has low health, medium damage, high speed, and medium agility. Pachyrhinosaurus is also 20 feet long. It breaks bones by using its instinct meter to charge forward. This will slowly drain its instinct until it stops or cannot charge further. After a short time charging, it will enable its bone break upon contact with an enemy or friendly, so once again, be careful. The Bone Break does not do much damage, but severely cripples the enemy. It's very good at log bashing objectives. It's high health, low damage, medium speed, and medium agility. Next we have a Margosaurus. This is 30 feet long. It uses its tail as a whip to deal bleed damage to enemies. It can use its neck to knock medium and small enemies to the ground for a short period of time. It's very good at clearing rubble obstacles as well. A Margosaurus has high health, medium damage, medium speed, and low agility. I especially think that it's fair that a Margosaurus is so big and strong because low agility is quite detrimental in a game like this. The last herbivore I came up with was a Rhinosaurus, but I don't want to give you my opinion on this. I want you to decide in the comments what you think this dinosaur would be best at and what its abilities would be. Next up, we have the maps to talk about. I thought it would be interesting if we used famous fossil formations as the maps. For example, there could be Hal Creek a forested map with a single winding river running down the middle. Or Dinosaur Ridge, a dry canyon with the river flowing down the middle once again, with trees to either side. And let me know if you can think of any other ones that would be cool. I really think that this game has exactly what the Isle, Beasts of Bermuda, and Path of Titan players want. Without the negatives of having to grow, take forever to find people in such a desolate world, and deal with dire consequences for making one minute error. You can stalk prey as carnivores, hunt AI using scent, and battle herbivores with fun abilities that are unique to your dinosaur. And herbivores can have that herd they always wanted, use cool abilities to defend themselves, and explore the world that's offered to them. I'm honestly hyped for a game I'll never be able to play. Now I'm sad. In terms of funding, there will not be a single playable locked behind a paywall. Everything will be earnable in-game, except for certain skins, patterns, and feature customization. None of which would affect gameplay at all, but would hopefully provide the cash flow needed for game improvements, maintenance, and updates. Anyways, I hope you guys liked this one. Let me know if you think this is a solid idea, or yet another reason that I should never cook again. Thank you so much for watching, especially if you made it all the way to the end. I'm super grateful for you guys, and as always, have a good day bro.